Now, we have actually had a question from former Conservative MP, former Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland. Now Harvard Fellow. He's a fellow with me at the Kennedy School. Excellent. And by the way, I thought on the election night, of all the Conservatives who lost, he was the most gracious. He came on the shows. Uh, he didn't run away um, and uh, lost his seat in Swindon with great dignity. And uh, anyway, Robert has sent us this great question. Hi, Ed and George. Robert Buckland here. Uh, loving the podcast and the fact you're able to disagree agreeably. It's conference season and we all have memories of great speeches that have been made from the podium. Some people think it's a dying art. But looking back, what is, are your favourite speeches from the past? Uh, I'll throw in one suggestion. Michael Heseltine from 1994 has a personal resonance for both me and Ed because he mentioned both of us in the same speech to the Tory party conference. But I'd love to hear your thoughts as to great speeches of conferences gone by. Gosh, well, um, blast from the past, 1994, Michael Heseltine. I'm sure Robert Buckland was, you know, a, a William Hague style rising star of the Conservative Party speaking, uh, mentioned by Michael Heseltine. I had just moved from the Financial Times to work for Gordon Brown. And, um, there had been a speech which had mentioned endogenous growth at a Labour conference in September 1994. Um, and Gordon had kept in this phrase, endogenous growth. Neoclassical endogenous growth It was theory. actually post-neoclassical endogenous post -neoclassical growth theory. Post-neoclassical endogenous By the way, if, you'd ever, if anybody ever asked the question, what is post-neoclassical I think we have answered theory, this question then, already. Well, I can, I mean, happily, happily to answer it again, because I'm not sure it's you know, quite got through. You know, I'm not sure either um, Jeremy Hunt or Rachel Reeves have yet fully understood the depth of post neoclassical industrial Anyway, theory. I think we're being sidetracked. The point is, Gordon Brown had used some economic gobbledygook. And it got laughed at. And then Michael Heseltine. And by the way, this is such a brilliantly delivered joke. You have to listen to the fact he gets my surname wrong. And the reason no, he don't, gets... Don't, let's hear it. Let's well, hear no, no, it. No, 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 no. Can... But honestly, listen for the surname being got wrong, because that is essential for the joke. It's really good. Well, last week, The Guardian disclosed that the speech had not been written by Gordon Brown at all, <laughs> but by a 27-year-old choral singing researcher named Ed Ball. So there you have it, the final proof, Labour's brand new shining modernist's economic dream. But it wasn't Brown's, it was Ball's. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the hall Wait. for that speech, and I I thought I remember laughing my head off. I thought it was it was unbelievably funny, and it was the making of you. Come on, it was it catapulted you into the absolute front line of British politics. Well, it was definitely the the high point of Michael Heseltine's speech making career. I mean, he got he got more plaudits for that than any other speech, and I'm very happy to have um, provided him with it. And it certainly it certainly thrust me, as you say, into the limelight. I was actually out in Washington D.C. Um, with Gordon, we were going to see Alan Greenspan and we were on the steps of um, the Federal Reserve in Washington when a call came through from Charlie Whelan to say that this speech which Hessel Tyler had done, which you know was already a little bit embarrassing from my point of view, the BBC, John Sargent, was leading with it on the six o'clock news. That was the story of the conference day and Gordon kind of like, you know, was kind of slightly appalled, I think. You know, what the hell had he done hiring this punk from the Financial Times who was now leading the BBC News with this surname and endogenous growth and all of that. We went in to see Alan Greenspan and I was sitting in this meeting thinking, oh my God, I'm leading the news. It's a catastrophe. I wasn't mm. thinking it was my breakthrough. I thought it was the end of my, you know, it was a disaster. And Gordon suddenly turned and said, uh, this is something you've been working on, isn't it? Tell Alan about it. And I hadn't been listening to anything that Gordon had been saying or Alan had been saying. So I had to say, I'm really sorry, Gordon. I wasn't listening. I was just thinking about the, the six o'clock news in Britain. And he looked at me with this withering look, which said, you know, you total tosser. <laughs> Turn back and carry on talking to Alan Greenspan. And that actually was in some ways the most humiliating moment of the, uh, the afternoon. But, uh, you know, it was my first appearance on, of, um, it was my first appearance on Have I Got News For You. Excellent. No, it was a, it was great. And uh, Hester was a really good conference speech giver. Actually, he he had several great speeches in his time. As uh, not as great as that one. So we got the conferences coming up. What's your favourite 
What's your favorite moment from a, 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 a conference? What's your not? We're not going to. We're not. Even, we're not allowed to include our own speeches here, right? So, someone else's speech. So I can't do David Cameron's surprisingly small tale. I won't do that one. Um, and it's, so I'm not going to choose either you or me. I'm not going to choose. I mean, there are so many. There's so many things you could choose. I'm not going to choose though. Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, Ed Miliband, Keir Starmer. I'm actually going to go back to for me a massively formative moment. Um, I was sitting at home, age 18, um, about to go off to university to study economics and politics for the first time to go to Oxford. And I sat alone at home watching the live coverage of the 1985 Labour Party conference in Bournemouth at a time where um, Labour had lost the 83 election. Michael Foote had been, you know, a um, bit of a disastrous leader. Neil Kinnock had taken over but, you know, Tony Benn and Militant were running rampage in the Labour Party still. And um, Neil Kinnock delivered this line. A Labour Council hiring taxis to scuttle around the city, handing out redundancy notices to its own workers. I'm telling you, no matter how entertaining, how fulfilling, the short-term egos. I tell you, and you listen. I'm telling you, you can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. That moment, I'm telling you, and you'll listen, he says, as the hall screams at him. You know, that was a big attack on And the, the Labour leader of Liverpool, Derek Hatton of militant at the time, the, the uh, insurgent kind of group. He, he's shouting back, isn't he? And I think he walks out, doesn't he, in the middle of the speech. And then Eric Heffer, um, who was also um, a uh, kind of Labour um, Shadow Cabinet member, walked out as well. And it was, you know, that line, you don't play politics with people's jobs and people's services. It was a full frontal, total head-on mm. attack on the hard militant left. And that surge in the hall when he, he said it, and people thought, yes, we're going to fight back against these people. And it was, it was such a leadership moment. It made him as the, the Labour leader. He didn't in, end up becoming the Prime Minister. He had a much longer journey through 87 to 92 than Keir Starmer's had. But the transformation that he led in the Labour Party over that period was monumental. And that was the speech. And that was the moment... If you want to know how public speaking can change the course of politics, that is an amazing example. I did. You know, I remember also watching that uh, as a teenager, and it was a big, it was a sort of pivotal moment in the politics of the 1980s. Um, so I'm going to pick something a, a much more recent and something I was much more directly involved in, and that was the uh, 2007 Tory conference. So I had given a speech where I'd said we were going to increase. Uh, the inheritance tax threshold, and this was all in the context of Gordon Brown about to call the general election, and the you know the Cameron opposition, which had you know we'd been doing well over the last couple of years, but suddenly we were on the back foot. Now Brown was the new prime minister, and the polls thought you know suggested we were going to be wiped out. The whole conference was overshadowed by this looming election, and and then David Cameron does something that no one had done before. I mean, it's been a trick that's been repeated since. But he, as party leader, gave the whole speech, which was like an hour long, without notes. And he delivered this final line as a kind of direct challenge to Gordon Brown. And uh, it was electric. And I, I mean, I think is the moment that stops the election happening and ultimately then paves the way for Cameron being Prime Minister a couple of years later. This is what he said. Let the people pass judgment on 10 years of broken promises. Let people decide who's really making the arguments about the future of our country. Let people decide who can make the changes that we need in our country. Call that election. We will fight. Britain will win. And again, it was so personal. It's this young guy challenging, the, you know, the. Gordon Brown had been around for years and um, using the party conference to do it. And, and that, you know, the fact that Brown then bottled the election 
couple of days later, which is something we, we should do one of our inside the rooms on that council election because it was an extraordinary week. Uh, but that, that party conference speech was massively important. And we started the week uh, 14 points behind in the opinion polls. We ended the week level. And a week later, we were over 10 points ahead in the polls. And so it was a huge shift in British politics, which really wasn't changed. You know, you could argue it wasn't until the general election of 2024 that, um, you know, things shifted back towards Labour. And the interesting thing there was we talked about this um, in the main episode last week. Sometimes party conferences are about an internal debate about you know, the party coming to terms with itself and its purpose and its future. And sometimes party conferences cut straight through um, to the wider sort of national argument. And in David Cameron's case, that is absolutely through the conference walls to Gordon Brown and down Downing Street, a direct challenge. The interesting thing about the Neil Kinnock one was that although that was an internal fight, he was, he was addressing his own side and his, his opponents in the hall, actually... Um, the willingness to do that also resonated around the country. It had a big impact, I think. So we've got Rachel Reeves's speech, and uh, she's under pressure, isn't she, to um, back down on the uh, cut to the winter fuel payment. I, I wonder if she'll uh, be thinking of uh, this famous conference speech uh, when she gets up to deliver hers. To those waiting with bated breath for that favourite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. <laughs> that was also a pivotal moment, wasn't it? Because that was the Thatcher government doubling down on monetarism, not doing what the Heath government had done 10 years earlier and sort of abandoning its economic plan. So these party conferences, you know, I, I know we live in a different age and, uh, uh, you know, of course, everything's now TikTok videos and um, social media clips and all that. And yeah, the days when the BBC would run live conference coverage all through the day, I remember as a teenager um, of the Labour and Tory conferences, they may be over, but there's still a role for the big conference speech. And, and you know, as we approach the next couple of weeks, Rachel Reeves has got a very important speech to make. Keir Starmer's got a very important speech to make. And those four contenders for the Tory leadership crown, it's the most important speech they are ever going to give. 